Please welcome today's speaker, Dr. Desmond Ford. You've all heard the song, Into every life some rain must fall. That is the most gross understatement of anything I have ever read in poetry or in musical composition. The fact is, into almost everybody's life, there are floods and cyclones or deserts or droughts, not just a little rain. The reality of life is this. We enjoy being loved and loving. It's wonderful to have friends. Our senses give us much pleasure. Being able to do things, that's grand. But also there is ambiguity. There's uncertainty. There are annoyances. There are irritations. There are embarrassments. There are frustrations. Just before I left America, the phone rang at midnight and a friend was on the other end saying that a friend had been involved in a very serious accident. Would I go down to pray over the, the wounded and all the friends and relatives that would be gathered? Well, it was about 200 miles. I got there about dawn, but the friend had died. Well, there was a big group of people and we had prayer. And I thought that that hospital was a symbol of the tragedies that overtake so many lives with losses of loved ones. But there are not only hospitals, there are courts, criminal courts. Many parents find that their children, male and female, are sometimes indicted for criminal activity. And then there's drug addiction. Then there are mental breakdowns. There's dementia. 44 million people in this world suffer from dementia. Nine out of 10 of those who get to 90 and over have dementia. So it's a rather cruel world from one viewpoint and Christians have to be able to deal with it and say something about it that may help the suffering. If there's a knock at your door and you opened it and there was a bedraggled tramp, skinny, hungry, thirsty, and if you knew that all the hungry and the thirsty would be behind him, one behind another, they would go round the world crossing mountains and seas 25 times around the world. The greatest dramas have always been tragedies because we are such that until pain strikes, we're not alive to half of reality. On an average day, most people have very unpleasant emotions as part of the day. They also find themselves reacting very foolishly and often sinfully to upsets. And then there are subtle fears that most people cannot put into words. But the reason behind all this is insecurity. It is because of insecurity that we are unhappy, that we lash out and that we are fearful. And there is only one remedy for insecurity. And this is part of our message for the world. The only remedy for insecurity is to know that we are infinitely loved. 
I wonder if you know the story of Manasseh. It's told us in 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Manasseh ascended the throne at the age of 12. Then for 55 years, he filled the city with bloodshed. He did everything that was contrary to the law of God. And after 55 years of patience, God sent the Assyrian army against Manasseh's people and they captured Manasseh and put him in prison and like a good number of people who find themselves in great difficulty because of their own faults, he prayed to God. And the marvel is, the record says, the Lord heard him and restored him to his throne and then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Now I ask you, would you be patient with some criminal for 55 years? I think not. I, I would not be. 55 seconds would outdo me. But you know, the distinguished thing about God is that he loves the unlovely. And that is my only hope, because I am one of them. He's called the Father, and I want you to think of some of the fathers of Scripture. Think of Abraham waiting for 25 years for a boy and when he gets him and has all the joy of seeing him growing up, the Lord says, I want him back. What must have been the heart of that father? I think of David, the most beautiful boy in his family, was a wicked, wicked boy by the name of Absalom. And when he got what was coming to him, David wept and said, Oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom, would God I had died for thee. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. But the best father, in my mind, is in the story about the prodigal son. And I think he's the best father, not just because he welcomed back the prodigal, but because he put up with the legalistic boy that stayed at home. And I marvel at the father's words when the older brother, who didn't want his brother to come home. When he complained about the father receiving the boy back, the father says to him, Son, you are ever with me, and all I have is yours. I would have said, I wish you'd gone and said to your brother. But he says, All I have is yours. Do you know that God is more willing to forgive sin than we are to commit it? Now, of course, we don't believe that, but it's true. It's not original with me. It comes from Spurgeon. Jill and I have worship every night, and we read Spurgeon's commentary on a Bible passage. And the other night we were reading, and that line dropped, dropped out of the book. God is more willing to forgive sin than we are to commit it. Hey, that's more than wonderful. That's miraculous. Last time I was here, I commented that God's love is like a mother who kisses a transgression into everlasting forgetfulness. One of my favourite verses in the Old Testament is this. He will not break the bruised reed, nor will he quench the smoking flax. Ever felt like a bruised reed? Of course, everybody does frequently. I couldn't count the times in my life when I felt like a bruised reed. But the bruised reed he'll not break. And the smoking flax that's ready to go out, he will not quench. That's what our God is like. You know there's a book in the Bible that's a f funeral book? Is that news to you? A funeral book. It's a requiem. We call it Lamentations. And I want to read to you some words from this funeral book, which is a dirge of sorrow over a city that's burning, over women that have been raped, over children that have been beheaded. And it's full of sorrow and lament. 
But in the middle of it, it says, I remember my affliction and my wandering. I'm quoting from Lamentations 3.19. The bitterness and the gall, I well remember them. And my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And you know, a beautiful chorus has been made on that. Did you get it? Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I'll wait for him. And then coming over to the 56th verse, 57th verse, you came near when I called you and you said, do not fear. You came near when I called upon you and you said, do not fear. There are 365 statements in the Bible about not fearing. That's one for every day. The best one and the most well-known one, of course, is in Psalm 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou art with me. A very great book was written hundreds of years ago. It was called The Practice of the Presence of God. It was written by a kitchen man, a man who spent his life washing up and cleaning up messes. And he wrote a book saying, I'm going to practice the truth that God is nearer to me than breathing and closer than hands and feet. So he wrote a book, The Practice of the Presence of God, which has helped millions of people. Because if you and I realized, believe, if realized and believed that God was that near, life would be different. We wouldn't fear and we couldn't hate. We would say nothing but were good for his ears to hear. We do nothing but was good for his eyes to see. The psalmist knew about this. He said, I have set the Lord always before me. Therefore, I will not be moved. Ah, there's a secret of living. I've set the Lord always before me. And therefore, I will not be moved. The practice of the presence of God. Some weeks back, I quoted to you from Psalm 139. How marvellous are your thoughts toward me, O God. If I should count them, they're more in number than the sea, the sands of the sea. Imagine it. The Almighty exercises more thought over you, over me, than could be counted. That's a wonderful thing to understand. Understand that. I want to mention three things today that are very important as you and I face the challenges of the ambiguities, the uncertainties, the annoyances, the irritations, the frustration, the embarrassments that everybody has. But first two things. You and I think there are interruptions when they come. Many times I have hidden to avoid being interrupted because I had something to do I thought was important. I've often gone bush to eat so I wouldn't be interrupted while I was having lunch and I could think about the next talk. But these things that I hate, which you hate, trouble, pain, uncertainty, embarrassments, annoyances, irritations, they're not interruptions, they're normal. They would lose a lot of their power if we realised that, that all the troubles are normal. We live in a rebellious world, we live in a sick world, and we too are rebellious. And God has made a world 
not in order to make us fill with joy and happiness. That's not the primary purpose of this world. This is a veil of soul-making. God is preparing us for eternity. He's making us ready to be people that are good to live with forever and ever. Hey, I have so many natural limitations, infirmities, sinful tendencies, I could turn heaven into hell. I need changing. So God sends me events to try my patience and I can either lose my patience and lash out verbally or physically or I can say, hey, this is not an interruption. This is from God because he knows how impatient I am. And God is trying to teach me to be patient. It's not an interruption. This is normal. This is for my benefit. If you and I could say that, that all the trials of life, they'd lose a lot of their strength and we'd be different people. According to scripture, all our troubles can work for us. Romans 8.26 says, all things work together for good to them that love God. Trouble is we don't believe it. But the Bible says no sparrow can fall without permission from God. The Bible says the hairs of our head are all counted. A much smaller job where some people are concerned than others. But regardless of that, he counts the hairs of our head. And not one can pass without him. I want you to think on this. I've quoted it before, but it's worth hearing again by someone who believed those verses. The Father's presence surrounded Christ and nothing befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. Here was his source of comfort and it is for us. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. Nothing can touch him except by the Saviour's permission. All our sufferings and sorrows, all our temptations and trials, all our sadness and griefs, all our persecutions and privations, in short, all things work together for our good. All experiences, all circumstances, are God's workmen, whereby good is brought to us. That's only an expansion of Christ's words. The hairs of your head are numbered, all of them. Not one sparrow falls without your Father's permission. I want to talk to you about three things in particular. We talked a little bit about prayer last time I was here. I want to say a little more because a person who doesn't pray is spiritually dead. <clears throat> no one's going to go to heaven that hasn't been a praying person. If they knocked on the door, people say up there would say, we've never heard of you, who are you? You don't go up to someone unknown and say, lend me $5,000. We expect to be in eternity with God. We must get to know him, get to know him by prayer. Have you heard of Ronald Niebuhr's prayer? I'm sure you have. Lord, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Give me the courage to change the things that I can. And give me the wisdom to know the difference. Why don't we say that prayer every day? Lord, grant me the serenity to accept what I cannot change. Grant, grant me the courage to change what I can. Grant me the wisdom to know the difference. If radio's slim fingers can pluck a melody from night and cast it over continent and sea, if the petaled white notes of the violin are blown across the mountains, and the city's din. 
if songs like crimson roses are culled from thin blue air, why should mortals wonder that God hears prayer? Richard Trench put it like this, Lord, what a change. One short hour spent in thy presence prevails to make. What heavy burdens from my bosom take. What parched lands refresh as with a shower. I kneel and all around me seems to lower. I rise and the whole distant scene, near and far, stands out in sunny outline, clear and fine. I kneel how weak. I rise how full of power. Why do we do ourselves this wrong that we are not always strong? That we should ever be overborne with care or with weakness and a failing heart, overshadowed by anxiety and trouble, when with us is prayer and with God is joy and strength and courage. You know, the best prayer that's ever been recorded outside the Bible is that of the great Roman Catholic saint, St. Joseph of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we rise again to eternal life. Isn't that worth praying? Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. The main reason for prayer is not to get things. Christ about seven times in the last day of his life said, whatever you ask in my name, I'll give it to you. Now that doesn't put idiots on the throne because he says, whatever you ask in my name, Whatever you ask, it's in harmony with what I am. But the main purpose of prayer is not to get things. It's to change us. Because my biggest problem, and yours too, is self-absorption. And self-absorption is self-destruction. Whereas self-denial is self-acquisition. Our biggest problem is self. What's the middle letter of the word sin? You've got it. An eye problem that no ophthalmologist can cure. Lucifer says, I'll be like the Most High. I'll ascend into the mountains. I will take over the throne. I, I, I. Adam, when he sinned, says, I am, was afraid. I hid myself. The Pharisee prays, I thank thee, God. I'm not as other men. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Hey, he'd have made a great neighbour. But he'd be lost because he was self-centred. The purpose of prayer is to rid us of our self-centredness because you can't come near to God without self-shrinking. When we really think about what God is and we realise how unlike him we are, a change begins. You've got to pray a lot because it's a big change. It's, God's got to work on us every day. He works on us often through trouble, ambiguity, uncertainty, annoyances, irritations, embarrassment, frustrations. He wants to make me patient. And sometimes I wonder, though I've been a Christian for 70 years, I wonder if I'm any better than the day after I was converted. 
Maybe the closer we get, the more clearly we see what's wrong with us. But the big thing wrong with us is our self-centeredness. And a self-centered life destroys itself. You know, I like Christianity because it's the easiest way to live. What looks the hardest is the easiest. What looks the easiest is the hardest. The person that is self-centered will have a very miserable life and no life hereafter. I knew a woman who was born a beautiful child. She had wonderful parents with one defect. They spoiled their children. And this beautiful girl grew up a very selfish woman. And every male life with which she had close and intimate contact, she came near to destroying. Married twice, two divorces. Had two children, lost the love of both of them. One of them cursed her until his dying day at the age of 87. A person that is self-centred reaps hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin and decay. But a person that is Christ-centred will get Christ and everything else thrown in. I repeat, the way that seems the easiest is the hardest. The way that seems the hardest, taking up the cross and following Jesus, turns out to be the easiest. That's why he can say, come unto me and I'll give you rest. You know, self can't cast out self. The only way I can get rid of me is by the expulsive power of a new love. You don't get the darkness out of a room by using a broom. You get the darkness out of the room by turning the light on. We can't get self out of the heart by anything that is self-centred. Only the light that comes from Jesus can get rid of the darkness of our souls, which is probably why the New Testament so often talks about looking unto Jesus. Consider him. They saw no one but Jesus only, the light that cometh into the world. We have to become Christ-occupied. Prayer helps us to that end. Now let me talk about the second of the three things that we must remember in order to cope with pain and trouble. The second one is faith in providence. There's no such thing as chance. An agnostic said that hundreds of years ago. His name was David Hume, Hume H-U-M-E, very famous philosopher. He says, there's no such thing as chance. Well, the New Testament only used the word once, and that's in a parable. As far as the Bible is concerned, there is no such thing as chance. And as far as the Bible is concerned, God is in control over everything except one thing. God will not force the rebellious human heart. The reason there is murder and theft and adultery and lying and so on is because the selfish heart rebels against God, thinks God wants to take something. And God never compels. God's a gentleman. God's in control of everything except the rebel heart. But for the believer, all rebellion is overridden by the providence of God. You know, the main reason mature Christians believe in God is not because of the arguments from prophecy or archaeology. <coughs> They're helpful. But the main reason mature Christians believe in God because they've had so much evidence of the providential leading of God in their lives. That's the main reason. Do you know the story of Gideon? Gideon's visited by an angel, and the angel says, Lord, be with thee. Gideon says, if that's true, why are we in all this trouble? We often think like that. If God loves me, why am I in all this trouble? The Lord says to Gideon through the angel, these Midianites are giving you all this trouble. You're going to get rid of them. Gideon says, 
we're, we're nobody, we're a flea. God says, tonight take your servant, go down to the camp of the Midianites, stop at the first tent and listen in. I'm reading to you from Judges 7. So Gideon goes down to the tent with his servant, and he stops at the first tent, and a man in there is telling his dream. He says to his tent mate, last night I dreamt a dream and a loaf of barley bread came down the hill and struck the chief tent of this encampment and it came down. His tent mate said, that's nothing more than the sword of the Lord and Gideon. So Gideon goes back. He knows it's okay what the Lord has promised. He's going to fulfil, and with 300 men, he puts to flight the army of the Midianites. Then you remember Pilate's wife. Pilate's about to condemn Jesus and send him to the cross when he gets a message from his wife. He only left her a few hours ago. Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things in a dream this day because of him. Now I want to ask you, what sort of a God is it that can control dreams? You and I can't. We can't even remember most of them when we wake up. What sort of a God can control dreams? What sort of a God can project certain people or ideas in dreams? Providence. Unless you and I believe God is in control of our lives, thing we've surrendered, We'll never have peace. We'll always have uncertainty. We'll always have uncomfortable emotions. We'll always be engaged in wrong reactions. We'll always be filled with subtle fears. Unless we believe that God loves us and is in control of us. You know, Paul could say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live... Yet not I, but Christ liveth with me. Now, you churchgoers, what hymn comes from that? Not H-I-M. H-Y-M-N. You know the hymn, not I, but Christ, be honoured, loved, exalted. Not I, but Christ. Verses of it. Well, it comes from that verse where Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live Yet not I but Christ lives in me. If we understand providence aright, we'll know we're never alone. We've never been lonely. Christ through the, Holy, through the Holy Spirit is present with us. Nearer than breathing, closer than hands and feet. That's the doctrine of providence. We believe it, he can turn sorrows into songs. He can take our tears and set them to music. Well, the third thing, praise. The praise of thanksgiving. You know, anyone who feels glad about anything and doesn't thank God is stealing. Ever thought about it? Anyone who's glad about anything and doesn't give thanks to the author of that thing, the stealing. There's a great book by Anne Voskamp called A Thousand Gifts. It opens up and here is this woman who's been told she has cancer and has no hope. Every morning she pulls the sheets over her head. She doesn't want to get up. She hates herself. She hates life. She does everything wrong. Then she hears of the gospel truth about praise. Somehow or other, the great book by Albert Schweitzer, Reverence for Life, makes its way to her home. And the main thing in this book, first of all, let me talk to you about Albert for a moment. <clears throat> Albert had three doctorates. But he left luxury and comfort and ease to go to darkest Africa. Spent about 50 years there ministering to the sick and dying, naked, poor, sick black Africans. Well, he wrote this book, Reverence for Life, and in it he said, 
the greatest thing is to give thanks. Now wait for it. The greatest thing is to give thanks for everything. He who has learnt that has learned how to live. He has pierced the mystery of existence. Now Schweitzer is thinking of things like Luke 22 where when Christ was in a few hours of the Father deserting him, within a few hours of the hammer knocking the iron through sinews and flesh, he takes bread and gives thanks. Luke 22, 19. Takes bread and gives thanks. Very interesting Greek word there for giving thanks. Eucharistio. Someone has said it's the key to the whole Bible. It has two other words in it. One of them is charis, which means grace or gift. And grace is God's goodness to those who are not good. Grace is God's mercy to the unmerciful. Grace is God's love for the unlovely. That's charis. That's part of eucharistio, Jesus giving thanks. The other word that's in that great Greek word is kara, which means joy. And as this sick woman reads, she realises that the height of her joy depends on the depth of her thanksgiving. Suppose your house was burned down while you are away today. You say, boy, I wish I hadn't wasted time listening to this forward. Maybe I could have prevented this. But the next day, lo and behold, everything's there. You say, it must have been a dream. It must have been a nightmare. And are you filled with thanks? Oh, this is wonderful. I've got my house back. I've got my books back. I've got everything back. <laughs> Listen, you've got them now. You've got them now. Moses can walk, can talk. That's not, not always an advantage. I have a friend of mine who says he prefers dogs to people. And one of the reasons is he says dogs wag their tail but not their tongues. But Moses want to talk and we can walk and we can talk and Moses can hear and we can read all, all the gifts we have. Oughtn't we to be thankful? And oughtn't we to be restful? When Pilate said, I have power to put you on the cross, Jesus said, you could have no power at all unless it was given thee from above. Hey, that's something to rest in. All your enemies, I have a few, God bless them. All your enemies, they can do nothing except God permits it. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You could have no power at all against me. Sickness, the banker, your neighbour, the robber. No power at all against me unless it's given thee from above. In other words, unless it's going to work for me and do me good. My friends, if we can learn to pray... Remember, it's not so much an activity as an attitude whereby we are always picturing God, always talking to God. I talk to him about the weather. I'll even complain to him if the weather's bad. Talk to God about everything. Ask his forgiveness, ask his help, ask his guidance. Ejaculatory prayer, brief prayers, like Gethsemane prayers. We can learn to pray. Self will go down and diminish. Then we're safe. If we can believe in the providence of God, he counts the hairs of your head. Nothing has any power against you unless it's given of God in order to bless you. And if we can learn to give thanks for everything, ah, there is the rob. So let me finish with a couple of warnings. When temptation or trouble or trial comes to you, when you walk out that door, you're going to forget everything you've heard. With every new trial, we forget all that we know about trial. And we think it's unique. I've never had a trouble like this. I've had hundreds of those. Trouble pops up and I say, hey, it's never been like this before. God solved everything else, but this is different. It isn't really. It isn't really. Samson slew a thousand Philistines and he was dying of thirst. And he felt he was had it because he didn't have a cup of cold water. He thought that little thing was a huge thing. That's the way it is with every trouble. It always looks unique, but it ain't. 
and it's nothing to God. And the second thing I need to say to you is this. If you say to me, Des, do you fulfil all those three perfectly? Of course I don't. Of course I don't. Do you try to? Oh, yes, I try to every day. Well, what are you saying? I'm saying this. God has to set before us the highest ideal. You don't want him to say to us, oh, look, be good occasionally. You don't want him saying to us, tell the truth sometimes, but you change. God always has to set before us the highest possible ideal. You and I never touch it because higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. But we're happy in proportion and we are successful in life in proportion as we measure towards that ideal. You'll never reach it fully. One of the greatest writers was a man called William Law. He said, you want the secret of life? Learn to thank God for everything that happens to you. Hey, William, Billy, what are you saying? He's saying the truth. And if you and I can try, and if you and I can grow in applying these things, then God will turn our sorrows to music and he'll take our seers, tears and turn them into songs. This program has been paid for by the partners and friends of Good News Unlimited. Word spreads fast.